Thanks, Cameron. And um, I do apologize. Unlike the previous session, I haven't color coordinated my slides with your hair. I hope that's OK. So yes, today's uh, session for me is about running a remote team. And um, hi, I'm Rob. It's good to meet you all. Um, I live up on the Sunshine Coast, so I'm about an hour north uh, from Brisbane. If, who, who enjoyed it? Anyone else live on the Sunshine Coast? If you don't, come to the Sunshine Coast. It's a nice place to live. It's a great place. And, and me living on the Sunshine Coast has so much to do with the fact of what we're talking about today, being working in a remote environment. Um, I have a young family. I've got three kids. I've got one wife. Uh, I play football on Fridays. Um, and yeah, as Cameron said, I'm, I sit in two different spaces when it comes to working remote. I work in a very small remote team. I'm on the Block Lab team with Luke here and Ryan, who's around as well. We're a team of three. Um, I'm in Sunshine Coast, Luke's Brisbane, and Ryan's in Mexico. Uh, I also work for, for X Company. Um, it's a sort of a family of a number of companies, but there's about 400 plus uh, employees, and it's 100% distributed, and they've been doing it for 13 years. So. Um, across the company, an incredible amount of experience in a distributed remote workforce. Made heaps of mistakes, you know, and learnt a lot from it. Um, but in a big way, doing remote before it was cool. Um, so I'm, I'm very privileged to have the insight that I've had from um, the, these, uh, these companies. Uh, so this is XWP. XWP is um, part of that X company group and um, was a WordPress agency. And we do a lot of uh, enterprise um, media, so la very large media sort of WordPress implementations. And we also work with a lot of large technology companies like um, Google and big commerce, helping bring the feature sets of their, you know, external to WordPress services and tools and products and bring them into the WordPress ecosystem. And then, like I said, I'm on the Block Lab team as well, and that's a, a WordPress plugin that uh, makes custom blocks for Gutenberg a lot, a lot easier than it is if you have to do it from scratch. So this is where we do the hands up part of every presentation. So please, hands up who would say they work remote? Okay, I'm, okay keep, keep them up for me, keep them up nice and high. I'm saying 50%. So who's been doing remote for more than one year? More than two years? More than five years? Okay, we still got some up. More than 10 years? More than 12, 13. All right, you two can come down and do the presentation because you know more than me. <laughs> I mean, remote work, we, this is not a new thing. I don't have to spend a lot of time with you today explaining what remote work or a distributed workforce is. It's not a new thing. The idea is not new. And it's been touted as an answer to so many different things within business for a long time. It's been trialed by many, 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 many companies around the world and seen failure because, you know, remote doesn't work. We tried that and it just didn't work. So it's not a new thing, but what I want to do today is take you through some things that I've observed. And this is not deeply scientific. This is not peer reviewed. This is my own personal observations. And these little things that I've seen, I'm like, oh, that was interesting. That's cool. I like how they do that. That seems to work really well and it fosters something that works well for remote. This is, an, this is interesting, and you know, uh, this is always good to see because when the term remote can actually represent a whole bunch of things, and there's this thing called the remote working scale, uh, one to five, you know, office space, which is just you no know, traditional office space, um, but then there's having work from home option, um, there's a remote team in a single time zone, or there's a remote team in multiple time zones, but then there's a remote team with like, you know, the digital nomads, which are the people that just sort of like hop and skip around the world. So there's very variations of remote work. And then even the difference between being a distributed company and a remote company, the standard sort of definition at the moment that I see is that a distributed company means that there is no office. Everyone in the organization works remotely. Um, whereas you could have some companies are remote, but they have a centralized office as well. So I know, you know, I mentioned for, for XWP and, and X company, it's 100% distributed. So 400 plus company in, uh, individuals in 30 plus countries and uh, there's no centralized office. So like it can certainly work at scale as well. Like we're doing it within a small three, uh, team of three at Block Lab. It's, that's easier, but it can work at scale as well. Uh, you know, why, why remote is great for business. You know, things like, you know, there's, we, we know this sort of stuff, so I'll, I'll go through this quickly, but you, know, you have wider access to a, you know, the talent pool, greater diversity when you 
go out of sort of like geo, you know, location restrictions, you get a greater access to different culture and different perspectives, um, you know, which gives you wider perspective. Uh, you get wider market access um, when you're engaging in different locations and different spaces because you are remote. You actually, it's interesting the insights you have on different marketplaces and different audiences that you perhaps wouldn't get otherwise. Um, this is an interesting one and slightly opinionated. May not be the case every time, but within remote, team members are assessed more on their work than on other things. Like, and, and this is a generalization, of course, but in the office space, someone comes into the office and their boss is like, Rob was on time today. He clocked in at 9 a.m. He he's always on time, that's great. That's not really work related. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a diligence thing, you know, arriving on time. Oh, Rob's always at his desk. That's really, really good. Oh, Rob's a really happy, conversational guy. Whenever I run into Rob by the water cooler, we have a quick chat. He's a really nice guy. And those, those, those things are all fine, and that's really, really good. But it's interesting if you're thinking about work, uh, team member performance according to their work, it's interesting how much those sort of things can impact the way people are assessed. Like I said, this is a generalization, but within remote work, there tends to be uh, the, the, the work seems to speak for the work, worker more often than not. Uh, if things go bad with a client, they can't come knocking on your door. Take that one or leave it, but that's um, nice. They can hunt you down on Facebook, Facebook or stalk you on Twitter if they like, but not hearing, you know, Rob, come and sort this out is, you know, that's a nice thing. Um, and for business, you can certainly save dollars. Uh, little asterisk there because disclaimer, you may not, poorly implemented, done badly and everything like that. But I would say from my experience of what I've seen that, that operationally done well, remote work and remote distributed workforce for the business has uh, operationally less overheads. And you know, you could dig into all the reasons how another time. But anyway, remote is great for the person as well. Um, commute is optional. Um, I have, so we are working for um, a client in Sydney and we were down there the other week uh, with, with XWP and we were meeting with them, um, their fantastic client. I was talking to him and um, one of the guys commutes two hours each, day, each way. So four hours total every single day from um, uh, the coast of Sydney, wherever that is. Sorry, Central Coast, thank you, thank you. Um, he's on the train, so I mean, like, I feel like if he was in the car, that's like dead time, but he's on the train, so he does a bit of stuff on like, but every single day, that's, that's brutal. Um, you know, you have a bit more control over your environments, you know, if you've got your office at home or elsewhere, but you know, you can make your space your space. This, you know, and everyone has, we have, you know, different things that we like, and you know, you can control the space that we work in. Um, and who actually said that nine to five is a, is a good idea? Um, it's not necessarily a great idea for the individual. And within remote work, we tend to be able to facilitate variation in, in time a bit more. Um, I work for Silicon, you know, in Silicon Valley, in Palmwoods, rural Queensland. Um, that's a fantastic thing about remote work is that, you know, 10 years ago, it was very difficult to access the kind of opportunities I know that I've been very privileged to access, and I know others here as well. Um, you know, couldn't do that unless it was because, um, you know, the companies that I've worked with and for um, believe in facilitate remote. You know, you can set the air con to whatever you want. Um, you can reheat that tuna casserole for lunch and no one's going to complain. Um, and once again, I would say, on average, for the, for the person, you're going to save dollars if you don't have to catch a train for four hours a day. I um, mean, if you don't have to live in a city, and living in a city is fine if you want to, but if you don't have to live in a city where, you know, cost of living is higher, you know, there's opportunity to, um, you know, impact on the personal budget and stuff like that. So remote's great, we know that. Um, I love this quote here, talent is equally distributed around the world, but opportunity is not. And I think about that a lot, and I, you know, I'm very privileged to live where I am and have in, you know, connections to the people I do. Um, but I think of the, you know, incredible talented people in the world around there that don't have the privilege that I and many of us have. And um, I think, you know, the growth of remote and distributed workforce in our industries helping to give access to opportunity for so many people. Uh, I think that's a really cool thing. But anyway, I just want to say, like, too long, didn't read, why remote is great for me. And people often say, oh, you know, you work from, you work from, oh, you work from home, right? Oh, you work from your house. And yes, okay, sure. But I, I, I came across this idea, and it was explained to me from a colleague of mine, uh, Brendan. 
<laughs> um, that working remote doesn't mean you just get to work from your house. It, it means you get to work from your home. Okay, and there's a distinction there and there's a difference. And what that difference is, is that when you work remote is you can choose your home, where your home is, the town that you live in, where you want to raise your kids, where you want to be engaged with the community and do things like that. And um, you know, you don't even have to actually work from your house to say that you can work from your home. So like, I work from an office space um, downtown, that's like a five minute drive, so it's not that far, and I rent it with a couple of friends of mine. So I don't actually work from my house, but I would say I work from my home. And I've been able to choose where my home is. I've been able to choose that. I want my home to be on the Sunshine Coast. I grew up there as a kid. It's a great place. I love the beaches. My family's around. <laughs> um, and the remote has allowed me to choose where my home is and has enabled me to you know, work from my home. And um, that's a really, for me, ultimately, the, uh, across it all, why is remote great? Is you get to choose where your home is and then you get to work from your home. But anyway. Remote is great, so how can we do remote great? How can we do it great? And I would, if I can wrap anything around all of this, is that it is about culture and community, not rules and procedures. If a company was like, oh, we're gonna roll out remote, we've seen the figures and we can see that we can reduce overheads by 15% in two years if we, have a, if we convert 30% you know, of our workforce to remote. So these are the procedures that we're gonna implement, that department, that department, that department. Uh, so three days of the week, you know, you know what I mean. Like, you know, and they, they map it all out and they hand over a, a how-to book, a set of policies and procedures to the workforce and say, all right, execute that and um, we're, we're remote now. That doesn't, eh, no, it, it doesn't work. For me, success in remote, and success in remote from what I've seen within you know, X company and in, in the small teams that I've been involved in is so much down to culture and community. So for anything that you implement, be it any of the things that I you know, show today, it should be through the perspective of how can we build a culture that is great for remote and great for remote workers. It's not just about rules and procedures. And also remote is everyone's responsibility. Whether you're a team of three or a team of 500 and whether you're like the CEO of a large organization or you're just one of the developers on the team, every, or, or you're a team manager to some degree, like you're, you're responsible for making sure that you and yourself and the people around you have a great remote experience. You know, I've, I've heard people say, oh yeah, I did work at a remote work in a company and I didn't really want to do it and it just sucked, remote sucks doesn't work. I'm like, well, okay, yeah, maybe your remote experience was poorly, but you know, you've got to facilitate yourself. You've got to set yourself and accept, and accept the responsibilities of working in remote as well to be able to have a good experience. Anyway, so these are Rob's six no fail whales to build a great remote culture and community for dummies. Um, number five will melt your brain. But <laughs> we have one, two, three, four, five, six that we're gonna go through. And these are all little snippets of things that I've seen that have worked over the, over the years. And the first sort of category is within communication. Um, who uses, if you're, even if you're not in a remote team, um, do you guys use, hands up please if you use Slack or an equivalent, like a, like a, like a you know, company message sort of forum sort of thing. One thing I wanna say is like, don't do back channel chats about work. And this is something that I've seen happen a lot. Because it's really easy to do. There's a the conversation happening about a piece of work, and then you're like, and I'm like, oh, oh Luke, oh, we were doing the, um, the rebranding of the, the shirts or something like that. And then it spins off into a, a, you know, a PM, a, a DM, a private conversation. And we make decisions, we work on stuff, and we arrive somewhere, and then we bring it back, and everyone else loses that context. So if, if, if there is work conversation, do everything you can to have that conversation in the, the, the appropriate forum, like whatever channel is set up for that work. Try not to do back channel work, back channel com um, communication. Here's another one, act like everyone is remote. If you're in an organization where like, you know, some people are remote, some people are not, and you've got a meeting of six people, um, and there's five people sitting in the room, and then there's one person, one poor person on a, on a laptop, and they're sitting saying like, I guarantee 100% of the time that that sixth person on a laptop who is remote will feel disconnected and disengaged from the conversation. Wouldn't it even be intentional? And even the other five people might be trying to like do their best to bring them in. But that, that divide that is physically there 
it just it breaks down the level for the, the ability for that person to fully engage and contribute, you know, unless they're super charismatic and, you know, you know some individuals are amazing like that sometimes. But, on, you know, for so much of the time they will be disconnected. Like, if there's five people in an office and one person dialing in remote, those five people just go sit somewhere else, around the, around the room, around the building, around the office, and all dial in and jump on the Zoom or Hangouts call. And what that does for the whole team dynamic to contributing to like better communication and better flow is, is um, it's, it's fantastic. Um, default to, to async as well. So asynchronous communication, shorthand for put it in chat, have the chat happen within the Slack channel that has been set up for that work. If you can default to async, it just, it, there's a little bit more structure there. And this is sort of like a, a, my average experience across a lot of things is that there's a little bit more structure there. It, it, is, it lets people that are perhaps, you know, within conversation in group chat, like on, on a call or a video call, personalities probably, you know, unintentionally dictate to how much voice some people are given and, you know, things like that. And I've just seen async communication facilitate good work communication um, so much better. And of course, there are always needs to jump on a, on a call and everything like that. And of course, when, that, when it's required, do that. But you don't need to jump on and have a meeting every single time. If you can async, async you know, type in, in the chat thread there and have your um, communication and your meeting asynchronously, um, incredible value. Uh, within that, whether it's on a call or in that, document all the things. Document things well. Uh, like I've seen, so I work with a bunch of um, project managers and team leads at, at X company who are just you know, world class and I put like one of the biggest things that makes them world class is their ability to, to capture things that, and decisions and moments within meetings and just document them well. And you know, not, not like, it's dot point, it's simple, but if it's captured, but what they do is they document as the conversation occurs and they, they capture the moments. They don't just document and say, all right, well, cool, we, today we had a two hour meeting. That was a, that's a very long meeting. A one hour meeting about this project and this is where we arrived. Document how you got there because, oh man, a week later, no one actually remembers that meeting. You're like, oh yeah, yeah, someone said something. And being able to refer back to just, just good, simple documentation um, makes a massive, massive difference. And here's an interesting one. This is, this is about you know, communication, but in a specific area, especially within HR, if you're in an organization doing remote of a larger size, like you're gonna have to invest more into onboarding. So imagine like, you know, you're first, you, when you, you've, we've all had a job. Um, you know, may, most of us have had a job. We've, we've rocked up for our first day into an office and, and you sort of like float around and like, you, like you're just there and, and you kind of get your head around stuff and, and you kind of just absorb what's going on and someone's like, oh, hey, Rob, you're the new guy. Oh, yeah, this is what we're doing over here. You know, there's a physical presence there that sort of just really carries onboarding along. And after a week or two, you're like, oh, yeah, I get how things work. But with remote, it's just, it's just not there. Like, if, if we carried that sort of onboarding practice through into a remote, you know, environment, you pull, you know, I can imagine a developer joining our team and we sort of handled onboarding like that, they'd be like, just sitting literally on their own, staring at an empty slack, just waiting for something to happen. So within, within onboarding specifically, we have to invest more into onboarding. You know, and you know, there's, depending on the role, depending on the project, whatever, depending on the person, um, you know, the, you know, that takes some many, many different thoughts, but we need to invest more into onboarding. All right, lost in translation. This is a really f funny one um, that catches people out all the time. It's just so easy to make assumptions about the things and the things that we say and how they translate. And it's not even always like cross-cultural, cross-language. Like my first, so when I first joined XWP, you know, at X company, I was a, came on as a project manager and I had, um, I had two projects with, two, with, a, with a Canadian client, uh, Rogers Media, and um, you know, they spoke English, or first language English as well. Canada, I would actually say culturally, there's a lot of crossover, even more than with Australia, even more than you know America and Australia, right? Like, and you know, and I just you know got stuck into it. I remember this one day I used the term, oh yeah, you know the you know the, the devs they're really on the coal face, um, you know, really getting into you know whatever the works are, and I moved on. And a guy, and a guy Matt at Rogers goes, oh, sorry, what? I'm like, oh, you know, they're really on, you know, really on the coal face. He's like, what's the coal face? I'm like, oh, you know, like you know, the, the furthest point in a mine, like they're the ones right at the end, they're like getting into the work, they're like, they're taking the mine deeper, they're, 
They're like, oh, okay. I thought you were making a blackface reference. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 no. And I'm so glad we cleared that up. <laughs> but I, and it's funny, it, it, things like that happen and it's hilarious, but always be careful about, especially idioms like that. Um, consider who you're talking to and be, be aware of you know, cultural differences, language differences, but even you know, subtleties like that. Cool, rhythm and routine. Like I said earlier, who decided that nine to five was right? Like, I mean, I have two, I have three kids, two of them are in, in you know, sort of kindy prep area. So like nine to five, like really conflicts like a lot with that, that routine thing. And, um, you know, being able to be flexible around that with remote is fantastic. Um, yeah, but like I can tell like, like nine, sorry, nine to five may not be right for everyone, but I can tell you what's not right, and that's like you know 6 p.m. to 3 a.m. Um, some people sort of swing pretty hard in the other direction, like, oh, I don't have to do the nine to five thing. I'm going to sleep in, go out and have just a cruisy lunch, and I'll sit down at work and 3 p.m. and I'll work through till 3 a.m. Like that's fine every now and again, but I would say that that's not healthy long term. That disconnects us from getting vitamin D, which is apparently very important to us, um, connecting with you know, people out in our community which are awake at normal hours. Um, but so like, of course, flexibility in remote, but let's be reasonable. And you know, build, and this is basically summed up as like, build routine. Um, I know when I first started working in remote, I just like embraced the flexibility and I was doing bits of snippets of work here and there and I'd just you know, jump over to that cafe over there for a couple of hours and I'd go somewhere else and it was fine and it was fun but it was really tiring. It really saps your energy when there's like, when you're constantly making decisions about what I'm gonna do next and when and things like that, it's really draining. So when you actually go to do your work, yeah, you know, you've got reduced capacity. So have routine, of course, but allow flexibility. Like, you know, I can go, if I have to do a doctor's appointment for my kids, I can, or I can do the, the kindy pickup if I need to, or if, um, you know, for whatever, you know, you can be flexible. You know, break your day up. Um, one thing that I've sort of built into my daily routine, like three or four days a week, I'll take like uh, an hour and a half break in the middle of my day and I'll go to the gym. Like remote lets me facilitate that sort of thing. It's fantastic and breaks my day up and lets me do something physical, resets my brain. But it, you know, so break your day up. You don't have to do like, you may start at 9 a.m. You may start at 11 a.m. You may start at 6 a.m. But you don't have to do a big, you know, eight hour block of work. Um, break your day up, it refreshes the mind and you know, resets you for whatever you need to do next. Um, so work, home separation. For a lot of remote workers, we work from home, our, our house. I mentioned that I actually have a little office down that I you know, you know, rent with my friends. So this is the biggest issue for me, but um, hands up please who work from their, who, who, who work from their house. Okay, um, please keep your hand up um, if you think you sort of struggle a little bit with the work home separation thing. All right, so everyone who put their hand down is a liar. <laughs> and I'm kidding, you just may be more diligent and, uh, than I am. But um, it's, it's an important thing. And you know, when you work at an office and you go to the office and you leave the office, it's, there's a great mental divide there that you can separate your, your work from your home. But man, for remote, you know, distributed workforces, we, this is an area that we've got to be diligent in because if your work home lines break down, like it's damaging. Um, so something to be very careful. You know, we probably spend like another hour talking about that thing alone, you know, things to try. But it's a good thing to be aware of. And look, you don't always have to be on. Slack's great, it also sucks. It's worse than email. Like, you know what I mean? Like getting pings at random times, like don't log into your work Slack on your phone. There's an example, like you could, or make sure you turn off notifications. And you don't always have to be on. Um, like my, my, uh, my, one of my, my boss at XWP, he's just, um, he's, he's a great guy and works really, really hard and always does really odd hours and is always like sending me messages at odd hours or following up an email that he loops me in. But he always says to me, he's like, Rob, look, I know you're seeing all this stuff from me at like, you know, 11 p.m. on a Saturday. It's like, you don't have to. Like, I'm not expecting you to respond at those times. I just know when you come into the office, you'll, then you'll pick it up when you're there, but like, you don't have to be on all the time. So sometimes that, that might have to be a candid conversation that you have to have with your colleagues, your you know, up line or down line or something like that. Like, all right, these are some, these are some um, standards we're gonna set for the way we work. Um, that we can decide when we're at work and when we're not at work. And it has to be okay. But when someone's not at work, that you, know, you, you shouldn't be expected to be able to reach out to them. 
Um, Scrum, like, so Scrum's like you know, a, a project management methodology. If you're familiar with it, you're familiar with it. If you're not, I, I probably can't explain it really easily. Um, but it's a basically a, a fantastic way of applying like an agile approach to a project. It works fantastic with web development. And you know, engineering development teams all around the world for years have been implementing it with great success. Um, I've actually noticed the practices of Scrum and the way the team's structured and the cadences within it really working well for just general operational teams or marketing teams or HR and accounts and stuff like that. And I know, so if, you, if you're working in an organization which is you know, a bit bigger um, and you've got teams dedicated to marketing or, or HR or, or something like that, check it and you're familiar with Scrum as well. Check out the practices of Scrum because I've seen like really interesting instances of success where just bringing that level of structure to non-project work really, really help, like productivity and clarity and getting stuff done. Uh, space. Look, this is just about the space that you work in. Um, like sometimes you go to an office, if you work at an office and it's beautiful, there's good light, they've invested into you know, good you know, plants everywhere and stand-up desks and stuff. And I, I'm the worst actually for my, for my personal remote home office. I'm like, oh yeah, I have these, it's gonna be amazing. I put like custom artwork up and everything like that. And I and like a month passes, three months pass, six months. I'm like, oh, I still haven't really set things up. But it's important that like if you have a zone for work, make it a good space to work. Because the, the, you know, the atmosphere and the space and the zone that we're operating in, it, it totally influences how we're feeling and how we're, you know, how we feel about the work that we're doing, how we're feeling about ourselves within the work that we're doing. Um, so now things like you know, having good light, you know, having you know, good screens. We're all sort of looking at screens all the time. If you can facilitate and afford a good screen, you know, like that, that's totally worth it. A good screen height, you know, that's not very really good for your neck. You know, but having it up here is, is really good. Actually, the interesting thing is that this is one of the really interesting things I've noticed about remote and working on remote teams. Like I, I work with, like I've worked with Ryan for like years and I had no idea how tall he was. You just don't know. And then occasionally you meet them in person, you're like, oh, you're six foot seven, you're huge. I had no idea. I mean, it's just one of the interesting things that you, anyway, the screen height thing, right? But anyway, so make sure you have good screen height. Um, like I love having a stand up desk, like, you know, do that thing if you like. Um, variation as well, like, you know, go to different spaces to break things up. It's amazing how often, like on a, like Friday, like end of the week and it's sort of like lunchtime and I'm like, oh, I'm so like, you know, winding down for the weekend, but I've got this chunk of work that I need to do, but my brain is just starting to switch off and go into Friday night football mode. And then I just go, all right, I'm just gonna go and I'm gonna actually go sit at, um, there's a little beer garden near my place. I'm gonna have a Friday afternoon beer, but I'm gonna open up my laptop and I'm just gonna punch through those last bunch of tasks that I know I really should get done before the weekend. And I just change my location. And it's, it's incredible how it just resets the mind and just, you know, you know invigorates the mind of it and you get that work done. So like be ver have variation in, in your space. You know, good audio, good air, good food, all that sort of stuff. Have a space for focus, but then also have a space for interaction as well. Like one of the things I do like about my, my little office co-working space is that I'm like, I'm not isolated from other people if I don't need, I can walk out and I can see someone and have a chat. Like being isolated, we'll talk a bit more about isolation in a second, but make sure that if you can have, have a space for um, interaction with others. Um, work should be more than work. Um, so within, you know, for instance, like, you know, your Slack channels and stuff like that, have channels for shared interests, like have a foodie challenge, a uh, cha uh, channel, have a beer channel, have a Friday night footy channel, if you, you know, whatever. Like if there are things that people within your team, your organization can connect over, have channels that people can just talk about that and connect and find shared interests. Um, well, here we go. Channels for shared interest, there we go. Uh, shared experiences, bounties and the vault. I'm just, I'll touch on that momentarily. Um, meet the CEO. Okay, this is interesting, right? Okay, say I'm working at a big organization of 500 people in, in, in Brisbane here, and we all work at the same office, and I go in, and I walk around, and I have, you know, I'm involved, I'm part of a team of six. So most of my interactions are with that team of six. 
But you know, then I go to lunch and I see those other people and I see those, oh, then I walk past, you know, the CEO and the leaders of the organization. And you know, there's just chances to engage with other people within an organization outside of your immediate team. That doesn't exist in remote automatically. It just doesn't exist. It'd be so easy. I've seen it happen for myself and others as well. We, when we have not been intentional about this, if you don't create space to meet the CEO or just others in the organization, it doesn't happen. And look, that can like, um, you, uh, you know, that can be like, like town hall style meetings or even, you know, fun days, like, you know, game days, or if you can do it, like in-person meetups, like Luke, Ryan and I have all got together this week around Brisbane here. Like, Ryan came over from Mexico and like, you know, we've been able to do in-person stuff. If you can facilitate that stuff, that's fantastic. What that does for connection and, you know, doing stuff is fantastic. Um, or, you know, strategy sessions. Um, so sometimes you need to go really deep into strategy and, you know, play some Rocket League. You know, this is sort of like a, um, once they, something that me and a few of the others at X Company, every Friday we sort of play Rocket League for a couple of hours, you know, for an hour or so on a Friday afternoon. And then just sort of let your hair down and relax. But, you know, that sort of stuff is fun. Um, professional development. Um, within a remote organization, it's harder to learn by osmosis. If you're in an office, it's easy to sort of like look over, you know, to, to sort of, hey, oh, you know, I'm just doing this thing over here, can you help me out? Or, hey, I saw, you, I saw you doing that, what about this? Or, you know, walking to lunch, oh, you know, having a chat about what you're working on. It's incredible what we can learn from each other just by being in the presence of each other. When we're working remote, we just have to be more intentional about it. So find ways to share knowledge. And that could be like anything, like if someone does something really cool on a project, find a way of sharing that with the rest of the team. Um, share wins. This is something that we're starting to implement at X Company. Like when something really cool happens within a project, capture that and share it with, we call them wins, share it with the wider organization. It's amazing what that fosters in conversation. And then it often turns into, oh, how did you actually technically implement that? Oh, we did a, you know, a headless Gatsby thing with WP GraphQL. I'm like, oh, I've been thinking about doing that. And, you know, and that, that fosters the sharing of information. Um, provide company access to learning resources. Um, and if, if appropriate, allow people to build time for just professional development. Like give them work allocated time for doing this sort of stuff. Oh, there we go. Oh, there it is there. Uh, well-being. So this is a social separation um, presents, according to a study, and I checked this out, so come ask me for the reference or the resource if you want, um, a 30% greater risk for early mortality. So social separation contributes a 30% greater risk for early mortality um, for those you know, following in social isolation. Um, that's worse than the most other health-related other health factors. So being separated from other people seriously can be dangerous. So within our remote work, within distributed workforce, something we have to be careful of. We have to be intentional about being aware of that and facilitating things to make sure we're keeping our friends, our peers, our team um, safe. And you know, this is everyone's responsibility. And sometimes that's encouraging people to have community outside of work. Um, Making check-ins, you know, just part of process, like for X company, when we submit an invoice, it goes to just another sort of form saying, hey, how are things going? Um, are you feeling happy about your team and your project? Just, you know, a part of process, just checking in um, on, on uh, stuff, you know, are you okay? You know, the are you okay day thing, fantastic. It should be part of our everyday. We should be like intentionally looking out for our peers um, and, you know, for their, uh, for their well-being. Uh, well so look, Six large buckets there with a whole bunch of sort of things that I've observed over the years. Uh, I hope maybe there's one or two in there that you found interesting and that you um, might take away. But uh, thank you very, very, very much for listening to me today and your time. I guess questions, correct? Yes. Um, yeah, thanks, Rob. Uh, yeah, again, if you have questions, can you please come down the front and okay, get the microphones? Um, yep. Res respect to the volunteers who have just been doing this all weekend, up and down the stairs. <laughs> uh, thanks for that. Um, I heard you say uh, number five is going to blow your mind. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, did it? Expand? Oh, no, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Just clickbait, mate. Okay. <laughs> I'll watch the video. I got you, but you didn't leave the room. You hung around. It worked. <laughs> no, that's all I wanted. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> In, in the middle there. 
Uh, thanks for the talk. Really um, good insight on that type of uh, work environment. Mm -hmm. Question would be, so for myself, I'm in an office space job. Yep. How would you go about approaching you know, the, the boss about potentially moving from an office space to a remote base working environment? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I actually haven't personally like, done tr that sort of transition myself, so I don't have a whole lot of personal experience. Um, I'd say like, like mostly it comes down to baby steps and making it simple, mm. like, hey, look, just a, a day a week. Like I mentioned that guy in my colleague in, in Sydney, he does the four hour commute thing. He said, hey, look, I'd love to just work a day a week from work. I don't have to go full remote, but if we could start with a day, that'd be fantastic. You know, so for, the, for maybe the upline that aren't familiar with it, or maybe have heard of bad things about it, like just keeping it really simple is just the, you know, the best way to approach it, broadly speaking. Yeah. Thank you. You almost touched on something in your talk um, that I think would have been really interesting. You said you'd get back to it, but you didn't. Oh, which was the something bounties about involving. bounties. Could you expound on that a yeah, little bit? Yeah, OK. So we have this thing in X company, um, and we're, we're really you know, proud of our remote culture and community. I mentioned at the start that, that really, I feel like that's how we should think about things, culture and community, not rules and processes. Um, but one of the things that we have is the, these ideas of, um, I had a slide, I'm sure I had a slide, but it didn't show up, um, but bounties and, and the vault. And you know, it's a gamified experience, but what it is, it, they, basically it's all about fostering shared experiences. You know, if we have a shared experience, like, you know, we, a bunch of us know each other from the WordPress Australia, Slack, and probably have crossed paths. But if we had a ch chat with each other last night at the after party, just having that shared experience outside of work, like all of a sudden, like, you know, there's a deeper connection there. It's more fun. And so bounties are about a shared experience and they can be anything. Write, read, or watch a film. Go watch um, Endgame, Avengers Endgame, and provide your opinion on who really should have died and share that in, you know, the movies channel completely un unrelated to work. It's a small, simple thing. Or there's more like, you know, more, you know, you know some, some bigger ones as well, like complete an online course about a subject that you've been wanting to do for ages and, and um, you know, share your feedback and experience. Or others are like more group ones, like go and attend, actually, I, I can do one for this. It was like attend a local meetup and teach on something you haven't taught before. So that, 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 that's like a bounty. And these things that create these shared experiences that aren't specific to it, like the job we're doing on that day, um, but they, they, they push people to try and do things that they maybe wouldn't normally do. And then they share it with the team and, hey, everyone, I've reviewed this wine from this region and it was really nice. And then someone's like, I've had that wine. That's really good. I love that wine. If you love that wine, you'll love this wine. And, and it fosters shared experience and shared connection. So they're bounties. And when you complete a bounty, you get like a number of coins, like virtual currency. Um, and then when you sort of save up your virtual currency, you can go and exchange them for items in the vault. So like cool t-shirts and caps and hoodies and no, don't, you can even donate to charities. So it's, it, that's a fantastic, so bounties in the vault, sort of abstract idea, but it's all about fostering shared experiences, which is so important within a remote, uh, remote team. Hey Rob, thanks for that. There's a uh, couple of little gems that I got uh, out oh, of cool. that as well that I'll be able to implement, so thank you. Um, one, of, one of the observations I'm interested in uh, that you may have is um, about the management of uh, your dress, personal hygiene and nutrition. <laughs> so that's a good one. What, within work meeting, like you're having a client meeting and someone comes on and like... Oh, just, just more into remote shorts. working. Like when <laughs> it, uh, you know, I've, I've been told that, you know, you should... Uh, you know, if you, if you get, turn up to work and, and sort of like a, a suit and tie or whatever, then you should do that in your remote workspace so you get prepared for, um, for work. And then, you know, when you're eating as well, like being at home, it's easy just to sort of whip into the cupboard and pull oh, out yeah. the, uh, the, the packet of chips and just hold into grain. that. That's, yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so really just managing that. So, yeah. so not only do you have a healthy work environment, but a yeah. healthy body and mental attitude. Yeah, so two things I would say to that is one is that the managers or the leadership of an organisation find ways to help encourage the kind of behaviour. Those bounties and vault item things that I mentioned before, 
is, is like is a, is a, an example of encouraging good behavior. Like some of them are about um, doing exercise related activities. And it, it's heaps of people that encourages them to get out and do exercise, which is health related. So there's things that like management and leadership can do to encourage it, but it is very much a self-discipline thing. And I feel like if anyone who's done either office work or remote work, you know, and work from home, you, you know that being, getting you know, presentable and eating well and you know, having a, like a, a home work separation requires so much more diligence. Um, so I think it really is, a, is it, if you can help encourage individuals to be diligent and you know, disciplined in those sorts of areas, it goes a long way. Oh, there's a couple up in the back. How are we going for time? We're right on the afternoon tea, but if everybody's willing to <coughs> Oh, quick, yeah, oh, I'm happy to take more questions. Yeah. We'll, go, we'll go two more minutes, is that all right? I think there was two up the back there, maybe the final two. One up the very back and one halfway-ish. Run, Forrest. Oh. <laughs> Way up the back, right up all those stairs. Pretty, pretty. How are the calves? There's a lot of pressure now. Yeah. Um, in terms of with your larger team, yep. how do you go with keeping people focused and checked in? Yep. So especially if everyone's working different hours, I think as a boss you want to give them the flexibility to be able to have that. Yep. But you also do need to check in and keep yep. them, make sure they're showing up for work and yep. that they're doing the right work, but also that they're doing it to the right estimated time. And, mm -hmm. you know, that, that can be quite a oh, balance. Yeah. Like, how, what was your experience to sort of get everyone and then keep them sort of motivated as opposed to being like, you didn't do this or you didn't do that, you know? Because yeah. that can be really hard remote. No, it's a great, great point. You don't know if someone's at their computer doing their work, you know, as you'd expect them. And it's, it is definitely a multi-pronged thing. So like our work is operate in teams and our team leads are very much, that's part of the responsibility to make sure that, you know, the team members are doing the work that they should be doing. And within the cadences and structure of, I mentioned Scrum earlier, within the smaller project teams, that's fantastic. But like more, more operationally across the organization, we have a few things that check in. I mentioned those, that form, like whenever someone, submit, we, as a, someone submits an invoice, there's a couple of things that allow us to, to check in and make sure someone's sort of okay. Um, and um, yeah, so there's a, there's a number of things that we go through, but I think the majority of it operates within the, the smaller team as well, the project team, so the team lead is empowered and equipped by the organization to sort of make sure that, you know, that person's okay, they're doing the work as expected, um, but then also they, as a worker, as an individual, are, are okay, you know, they're not burning the candle at both ends because, you know, that's not good for them. Um, so yeah, hopefully that helps answer your question. Yeah, for me, it's about training. Like, how do you, because um, it's so frustrating for me having to teach them how to use Trello and Slack every single yeah. time I hire somebody. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying to automate that process. Yeah. Because the tools can get really complex, like when you have a full system in place. And I'm just, when you're teaching the 20th person how to do it, like, it gets really annoying. Yeah. Do you guys have a system for that? We, we definitely have a system. And, like, we have some, like, pretty hardcore, like, JIRA stuff. Like, real, like we, especially with our big enterprise projects, which is sometimes... 12 months long, someone might join a project that's like six months into it and it's got like this crazy architecture going on. So like, it's, it's, there isn't an easy way, it is hard. And I, I mentioned the onboarding thing earlier and is that you just have to, in, like in our experience, invest into it. Having good documentation helps so much. Like if we're bringing someone onto a project, um, being able to say, hey, look, this is how we document. This is how we have meetings and everything like that. If you need to you know, refer back to something that occurred previously, this is where you can expect to find it. But when it comes to like onboarding, yeah, Trello or, or Jira or HR tools and stuff like that, it just comes down to, yeah, investing into like, if it's a, a video walkthrough, like, this is how we do things. Um, and structuring it as well, like we've probably all had an experience where we've, we've started a job and just been absolutely knocked over our head with like a barrage of information on day one and forgotten 90% of it. Um, you know, so reducing that expectation, have it all in one hit and just, you know, progressively introducing them to the way that the company and the team works. But yeah, I, I, I have never seen it done easily. It's just about, yeah, investing in, in time and producing resources. I think that's it, right? 
I think that's it. Let's have some morning tea. Thank you very much for your time, everyone.